Kia ora, hey Marky here, back again, still feeling rough, rough around the edges, but I'm um, quite keen to continue to tell the tale. Okay, so where did we get to? I am now, during the weekdays, staying in this little annex to this half empty mansion house. Uh, with this, uh, so there's a, a, a woman of about the same age as me, I guess. Um, shares there's two bedroom annex. She shares. Uh, she's got one bedroom. I've got a bedroom at the far end. Shared bathroom and kitchen. And uh, but I'm paying the landlord who lives in the big house. So I pop, pop over to there and meet him, who is a real character. <laughs> um, uh, introduces his wife. I, I won't say his name, um, but he's, he introduces his wife as a user of name. This is the first Mrs. O'Grady. Um, and he says, "I call her back to keep her on her toes." <laughs> so she's a nurse. She's she's there in this sort of house cooking. The impression I get from going in there is that they only use a few rooms, and the rest is kind of you know vacant. These empty rooms is all very kind of gothic, really. Um, and uh, he, lovely guy, uh, he fixes everything with gaffer tape. He would come around and fix stuff with just with gaffer tape. So the whole place is really kind of run down and everything held together with gaffer tape. Really cold, really cobbled together. And the person uh, who, um, who I'm uh, sharing the, the flat with the annex with, um, you know, I get to find he's quite a difficult person, uh, uh, somebody that kind of just gets into kind of hate wars with people for no apparent reason. Lots of, lots of anger, lots of, lots of hate. I remember telling me that she was, she was doing this work and was getting a lift share with somebody uh, and was hating on them because they play Phil Collins. Now I hate Phil Collins <laughs> as well, but I can't, I couldn't, I wouldn't have quite such a strong antipathy towards somebody um, that like. Phil Collins, especially if they were giving me a free lift at work, you know, I kind of think I would overlook <laughs> their love of Phil Collins. I've got mixed feelings about Phil Collins. I like some of his stuff. I like quite a jealous if <clears throat> there's something really annoying about Phil Collins. Um, I think even Phil Collins recognises that. There we go. Phil Collins tangent. That's kind of a spooky thing, Phil Collins. So, um, <clears throat> and the other thing I realise is uh, that, first of all, she kind of seems like this, you know, I think I've landed on my feet because she seems like this earth mother kind of feeder because she's always cooking things and you know, saying, oh, would you like some of this and would you like some of that? And, uh, which I think was her and her best behaviour at the start. That kind of seemed to ease away. And she would just leave the kitchen in this just absolute state of filth, really. Um, you know, so it was, uh, and just piled up, you know, piled up washing up for, you know, a bit like with Nail and I, really. <laughs> so, so that was, that was kind of that. But we were kind of still getting on okay at that point. We had a lot of uh, things in common. So, um, yeah, and the guy that, the landlord, because um, I, was, I was kind of quite lonely there in the evenings, and, um, and, and the person I was sharing flat with, she didn't, she didn't really want to do much, or she did her own thing, and, and stuff. So I ended up going to the local pub for the pub quiz with the landlord and his merry band of bell ringers. They were all bell ringers in the church, the famous church, um, which is just opposite. Uh, which is associated with the Alman apparitions. Okay, um, interesting bunch of people, all quite high flyers, you know. And this guy, um, the, the the landlord, was you know made it quite big in the oil industry, but kind of retired. Um, so uh, kind of strange company. We were strange bedfellows, me and these these bell ringers, kind of going to this pub quiz once a week. But there you go, and it was a really nice pub, you know, a good old traditional sort of British pub. So, and this Alex and the flat were kind of co-joined in, in some way, I found out later. There was like a little atrium in between the two, and I remember, uh, the, I need to give a, a pseudonym to this person I shared a place with. Um, what should I call her? Um, oh, um, I don't know, it'd be too pejorative. What should I call her? I'll call her Myrtle for now. Okay, she doesn't, it's not, it doesn't quite hit the spot, Myrtle, but we'll call her Myrtle. I'm kind of thinking Moni Myrtle from the Harry Potter films. I quite like Moni Myrtle, but a little bit of a similarity, actually. Yes, that's interesting. There's a bit of a similarity in physical appearance between her and Moni Myrtle. Yeah, so Myrtle was also an artist. It's some quite interesting stuff. 
um, quite kind of you know pagan atavistic kind of themes. Uh, so yeah, this house was you could so apparently at one point Myrtle kind of lost a key and I wasn't around, couldn't get in, and actually got into the property uh, through the garage and then through parts of this kind of mansion house and then kind of managed to gain access. And it's funny, I've always had this recurring dream of uh, living in this property where there's no clear boundary with the neighbours and there, there are kind of hallways uh, that lead on to the neighbouring property and there's always some kind of um, ambiguity about you know who owns what and who the property belongs to. Uh, and those dreams always had quite a kind of sinister feel to them. So, so this place resonated with those dreams and that feeling as well. So that was all going on. You know, all quite quirky and eccentric, really, but nothing, you know, nothing particularly kind of harmful or or worrying. Um, so uh, Myrtle had a boyfriend, uh, and the first time I met him. We, you know, uh, really took an instant like to, to this guy, great guy. Um, I might name him, maybe, I don't know. Um, um, probably better not to. Um, but he's got quite a high public profile. And we were doing that chat, you know, the kind of what do you do type of chat. Um, and he was a little bit cagey. Uh, so he was, he was running a course. I think at the time he was sitting up with a local college I don't think it actually went ahead with the local college, but he was talking about he does wood he did wood carving and he did uh, and he taught in college. I said, "Oh, what do you teach?" And he, he said, "Kind of folklore." And he was giving me kind of one word answers and stuff like that. But eventually, you know, I, I persisted because you know I was interested. Um, I had a feeling it would be interesting. And he taught magic, so he taught witchcraft, magic, cult, both practical and theoretical. Okay, so among other things, I took his course. Um, and it was brilliant. Um, and he actually, I've actually got a certificate in witchcraft, magic, and occult from this course. So, uh, and it ran in various different locations, and that, that was all kind of quite weird as well. So, the first location was in Penzance. So, bear in mind, um, on a Monday, I would travel from Stoke Gabriel, of a, a sparrow's bar, as we say in the UK. I would drive, do a full day's, go to Truro, do a full day's work, which is, and it was a really challenging job at the time. And then I would drive to Falmouth, uh, or to the other side of Falmouth from Mornan. Um, and then, I, or I would go directly to wherever this course is. So actually, I would probably go straight to. No, I would drop my stuff off because I had a car full of stuff. So I'd drop my stuff off uh, at this annex, this spooky annex, uh, in this spooky little, down this spooky little lane, uh, as, uh, adjoining this spooky little house. And then I would go off to do his course. And you know, I'd be knackered and hanging, but I was always wide awake because this course is really interesting, really steep. He's a great guy, really funny. Uh, so do this course. First off, it was in this weird place in um, in Falmouth, and it belonged to some kind of society, and it had a very Masonic kind of feel to it. It wasn't a Masonic court, but it was a very, very Masonic kind of place. Maybe you know, I can't even remember the name. Maybe I don't know what it was, um, but really beautifully, get these beautiful furniture and. Um, you know, um, amazing, oh, just, just the whole decor of this place, but it felt like a Masonic hall. And then later on, uh, the course actually started to take place uh, somewhere else. At the other end of Cornwall, uh, actually in East Cornwall, in the Boss Castle Witchcraft Museum, uh, which is an amazing place. Um, and, you know, can you imagine how kind of spooky that was, kind of talking about witchcraft when you're up surrounded by all these artifacts? You've got kind of... Um, carvings of buff and that and things on the wall and stuff like that and apparently um uh this guy who um i was trying to find a pseudonym for him as well really um what should we call him so we've got myrtle um we've got um let me give him a kind of a kind of celtic a celtic cornish name if you like let's call him bryn bryn let's call him bryn so bryn at one point uh there's a flat uh, or there was a flat um around the back of the witchcraft museum and he stayed there and talked about kind of weird stuff happening and things i think the bath there was a baphomet statue in there i think that flew off the wall something like that so that was a, a good and i got to meet graham uh who uh, was at the time the owner of the museum a lovely guy a real kind of solid stalwart decent nice guy coast guard and folk singer and 
um, and, and he just had such real passion for, and he's always showing us things, oh, look at this, it's lovely, and sometimes these things are really quite dark and macabre, and you say, oh, this is really lovely, it's lovely, look at this. I remember once, I coming, it was raining, and I was dripping with rain, you know, you kind of got it all dripping off you, and, and he'd come in and he'd say, look at this, look at this, and, and he was showing me this kind of, um, this original book from the 1500s, and, and I was thinking, well, this is quite bad. You know, I don't want to get, get water on it. I'm kind of... So, so yeah, so it's some interesting experiences there. But long distance, as long drives are talking back and forth. On, it was on a Monday, the first day that I, you know, travelled up. So I was hanging, but buzzed up, you know, really buzzed up from doing this call. So it's still in this first conversation with Bryn, okay? So he kind of eventually kind of confesses that he um, <laughs> he's doing this course in witchcraft and magic and I, I guess I'm reassuring him because I kind of have some resonances with that and some some of my own experiences with that um, so um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say I was ever a pagan with a small p certainly a pagan with, uh, sorry I wouldn't say I was ever a, a full-blown pagan but certainly a pagan with a small p um, I guess you know religious wise I am I am many things and I am nothing I'm, you know I have lots I have many to well ten toes to be precise um, and dipped in different places and I have a very open mind so paganism is certainly something I'm interested in and uh, I'm a druid uh, now that's something we, that um, I probably don't talk about really in, in there's one video I think where I touch on that um, and druidry isn't what people think it is so uh, people think all oh, pagan not necessarily yeah, but you know there's a very strong pagan thread in druidry uh, complicated subject big issue Another day, all right. <laughs> Even for this kind of um, uh, windy avenue ridden video, that's a that's a whole big subject. But um, at the time, I was trying to start a project which is now uh, a flourishing. Okay, the Bardic Chair of Exeter. Okay, and that was something that I mentioned to Bryn, and that. Um, opened up a very a huge helpful synchronicity uh, that actually prevented people from being harmed okay and I will talk about that in part four around your mouth